Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and thank you all for uh, turning up at uh, Sunday morning. Um, so I'm not sure how much hilarity. There, there might be a bit of gloom, uh, but um, the hilarity I'm not so sure about. Um, let's uh, um, begin by looking at this picture, this uh, beautiful picture by the painter Bruegel. Uh, it's called The uh, Fall of Icarus. Uh, and it has uh, many different meanings. So there are many different interpretations of this that kind of all fit together with what I will be talking about today. On the one hand, of course, you can see Icarus plunging into the sea here. Uh, as you remember, Icarus was the son of Daedalus in Greek mythology, the great engineer, uh, who had built his son uh, a pair of wings made out of wax and warned Icarus not to fly too close to the sun. Uh, but Icarus got carried away, and the wings melted as he got too close to the sun, and he plunged into the sea and died. Uh, and so this is often a symbol of uh, overreach or hubris, in particular technological hubris, and the dangers that are associated with that. Um, so that's one kind of theme, um, which we shall return to later. Um, the poet Auden uh, looked at this in a different way. He saw it as a representation of man's indifference to the suffering of fellow man. So you can see the uh, peasant here and the herder continuing doing their business, uh, seemingly not caring at all about the, uh, the tragedy that has just befallen poor Icarus. Um, another way... Uh, of reading this picture is uh, as a statement about our obliviousness to the larger things that are going on. So here is this cosmically significant event. Uh, one of the gods or demigods uh, have just perished, uh, and it doesn't really affect uh, the goings-on uh, by the people around here. Um, but then again, if we think about it, maybe the significance is actually the opposite here, that yes, he plunged into the sea, but in the long run, it might be the activities of the plowman and other people like that that has had a much more profound impact on uh, human history. Um, although this wasn't always obvious to people that the accumulation of a lot of uh, little steps could amount to something great. Uh, the, Eminent um, uh, economic historian Robert Heilbronner once wrote that at the apex of the first stratified societies, dynastic dreams were dreamt, visions of triumph or ruined, entertained, but there is no mention in the papyri or cuneiform tablets <laughs> on which these hopes and fears were recorded that they envisaged in the slightest degree changes in the material conditions of the great masses, or for that matter, of the ruling class itself. So if we think of um, some schematic representation of uh, what has happened so far, we know that at one point in time there were no humans, and then there were humans. There has been some development within the human species, uh, agriculture, uh, industrial revolution, and so forth. And we might wonder what might come next. This, of course, is, a, is not meant to be taken literally. The axis here are... are was kind of merely evocative rather than purporting to be quantitative. Uh, and we don't necessarily have to assume that the y-axis, that up, is necessarily better. Uh, on the y-axis, we have some kind of notion of level of development. Um, and on the uh, x-axis, we have time, but obviously it's not drawn to scale. Um, so now we can consider some different categories of possibility for what might happen in the future. One, of course, is that if we think of there being a kind of pre-human or subhuman condition, a human condition, and perhaps something above that, which we should return to, that uh, we will remain within this, this, uh, this interval that we can call or think of as the human condition. And Maybe we will just stagnate at more or less exactly the level at which we are right now. That's sort of the lower dotted curve. 
or maybe we will continue to grow a little bit further and then stagnate, but before we have developed so much more that we have you know, fundamentally changed the human condition into some kind of post-human condition. To evaluate the possibility of this category of possibility, um, it's worth taking a look at what has happened uh, before to get us to this point where we right now are. This is uh, a plot of world GDP over the last uh, 110 years. Um, here is world GDP over the last 2,000 years. Now here you see a very dramatic spike. <clears throat> Looking at this, just eyeballing it, it doesn't immediately suggest that from now on there will be a kind of a straight horizontal line. It, it doesn't seem to be slowing down at this particular time. If we look at it over an even longer uh, period of time, uh, the 100,000 years, you, you really uh, don't see anything up until, you don't see any bend, you just see, see a big spike coming out. Um, we can um, uh, get a little bit clearer uh, over these long time scales if we uh, substitute for the y-axis a logarithmic scale. Um, so before we had a linear scale, now we have logarithmic scale. And if the world economy had been growing at a steady exponential rate, then you would have a straight line in this graph. But instead what you see is that even on this logarithmic scale, you still get an upward bend. Uh, and uh, over a longer period of time, even more so. Uh, so it's not just that the world economy has been growing, but the rate at which it has been growing has itself uh, increased. And the world population um, similarly uh, shows a very rapid spike recently. <clears throat> Another kind of reason for being skeptical about this stagnation hypothesis is that there seem to be a number of different possible technologies, which we don't yet have, but which seem to be physically possible. We can imagine some paths that would eventually get us there and which, once developed, would seem to have a good chance of fundamentally altering the human condition. Um, for instance, machine intelligence, um, if and when we can create machines that um, are uh, much smarter than humans, that could be one of these potential revolutionary technologies, machine phase nanotechnology, um, human enhancements technologies. So, so far, most of our technological might has served to change the world around us, and indirectly that has changed us. We have communications technologies and we are better fed and so forth. Uh, but we haven't, to a great extent so far, used technology directly to change human biology. You know, medics might fix some things when they go wrong, but enhancing our basic biological capacities has not really been possible to a very great extent yet with technological means. We do it with education and so forth, but, but not through genetic engineering. But uh, once that becomes possible, a whole new frontier uh, opens up. Information technologies, fully immersive virtual reality, and various institutional innovations as well might contribute. Um, and so for all of these reasons, uh, one might be skeptical of the stagnation hypothesis. One might even be so bold as to conjecture, and of course um, this is not known, but one might put out for consideration what I'd call the technological completion conjecture, which says that if scientific and technological development efforts do not effectively cease, then all important basic capabilities that could be obtained with some possible technology will be obtained. Um, so you can think of this as if you had a big box and you were pouring sand into it. Now, the exact distribution of sand in the box at any given time will depend on where you pour the sand. But if you keep pouring enough sand, then eventually the whole box will fill up. That's the intuition behind this, that obviously if you fund you know, more research in chemistry, then you might get more 
new chemicals developed quicker and you might get slower progress in some other area than if you spent money there instead. But at the end of the day, once you achieve a sufficiently great level of general technological capability and general scientific understanding and have enough money around, then a lot of the technologies which you didn't develop initially become so easy to develop that if they have broad utility, they are likely to be discovered sooner or later. That's uh, at least a proposition that one could consider. It's not essential for, for the talk. Um, so this, this was one class of possibilities. Um, um, what other possibilities are there? Well, one is if we are skeptical about sort of things suddenly just screeching to halt right where they are now and then continuing unchanged forever, we can consider um, a category of hypotheses where the future will not be static, but neither will it break out from this human condition. You could imagine a, a, a series of growths followed by collapses and then maybe recovery uh, building up again and then perhaps a new collapse. And this pattern, one could imagine, could repeat itself. Um, now, if we're thinking about the long term, however, uh, there is a slight impossibility to this in as much as the collapse would have to be quite carefully calibrated at each time. It would have to be, whatever causes the collapse would have to be strong enough to actually bring about the ruin of world civilization and, and a regression in technological development. Uh, but not so strong that it causes human extinction and we sort of drop down below that band. So one might wonder what, what kind of possible cause could that be? And moreover, it would have to be such that each time this thing happens, each time we get sufficiently close to breaking through upwards there, some kind of cataclysmic event happens. So obviously the longer the time scale you're considering, the greater the chance that we will move out of the human band, either up or down. <clears throat> but this um, idea of uh, a kind of cyclic history uh, has been very uh, plausible to many people throughout history. This, this is one of the you know, dominant strands in, in sort of ancient uh, thinking about the structure of the world in many different traditions. Um, Buddhism, obviously, but in many other, there was this idea of, uh, of a kind of uh, rise and fall, and just as the year has a spring where things are born and an autumn where things die, and then it's renewed. Uh, so many people thought that the world itself was moving in these kind of cycles. Um, and it might be difficult for us to appreciate just how plausible that outlook must once have seemed. If you think of human society or human affairs as a finite system that has finitely many different possible states, and you imagine that the world has been around forever, then by logical necessity, we will now either be recycling through a state where we have already been or we will have gotten stuck. There are only finitely many possibilities. If you keep moving from one to another, you will eventually exhaust them all. Even if the world has infinitely many different possible states, there might only be finitely many of them that are significantly different from one another. So if, if everything was the same, except that there was some little atom that was infinitesimally closer to some other atom, we could count that for practical purposes as the same. Um, so with these assumptions, it seems to follow with ironclad lo logic that um, the world must uh, be eternally recurrent. Um, now, the reason why this is not actually the case is that the world had a beginning. Human kind has not been around forever. We have been around for maybe 100 or 200,000 years. Um, and modern history only for maybe, well, agriculture, 10,000 years or so. And that's just not, not nearly enough time yet for us to have exhausted all possible configurations. You know, more fundamentally, the reason um, is that the universe itself has only existed for a finite period of time in the Big Bang. 13.7 billion years ago, 
uh, was a kind of a start, and that gives rise to uh, in a low entropy state, and you then have an entropy gradient, and the universe is gradually running down, but uh, it hasn't yet started repeating itself. But unless you know or believe that, it's hard to see how you could avoid concluding that there must be eternal recurrence. Um, anyway, so so much for this class of scenarios which uh, have that in common that whether it's a stagnation or whether it's a repeating uh, regrowth and collapse, that it remains forever within this human condition. Uh, now let's consider another category of uh, scenarios, um, extinction scenarios. <clears throat> if we look back, we can see that there have been many big catastrophes. Here is a, a partial listing of uh, disasters that have killed uh, more than 10 million people. Um, if you look at this list, uh, you see the majority of, of, of these big culprits are either germs or, or bad men. Uh, there are some instances of famine, but they are usually related to, to violence and therefore to the bad man category. But as horrible as all of these catastrophes have been for, for the people immediately afflicted, if you zoom out and you look at the human condition, as it were, from God's size uh, point of view, even the biggest of these disasters will not register. So in the, the, history, the, the world economy growth curves that I showed, or if you had uh, displayed world populations, uh, these would not even be visible. Well, maybe uh, the, the Black Plague would be a tiny little dip in the Middle Ages. The, the rest would just be lost in the noise. It makes no difference. Uh, at the end of the day for how much human happiness and sorrow there will ever have been. Um, we can think of catastrophes as coming in different categories. If we plot on the one hand the severity of how, how, how badly affected each affected person is, uh, you could be sort of imperceptibly affected. One person might lose one hair, it's a small harm, and you don't even notice it. Or there could be something more severe, uh, car is stolen, it's a, real, it's a real harm, but you can still have an excellent life even if your car was stolen. To a terminal thing, like a fatal car crash, or maybe lifetime imprisonment, or permanent severe brain damage, or something like that, that really kind of drastically caps how good your life could be. Uh, and you could plot on the other axis the size of the population affected, so it could be one person, it could be some local population. It could be the whole world. And it could be something more than the whole world. It could be the whole world for all time to come, transgenerational. So on this, we can distinguish global catastrophic risks. These would be global risks of at least endurable severity. Uh, and the ones I mentioned on the previous slide would all be global catas catastrophes. But then in the uppermost and rightmost little uh, box there, we have a special kind of risk, uh, where a human extinction is an example, and the general category is that of an existential risk, defined as one where an adverse outcome would either annihilate earth originating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its future potential. Now, the good news is that there has never been an existential catastrophe. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't be here otherwise. However, um, there are some considerations that suggest that we shouldn't dismiss the possibility. First of all, extinctions do happen, uh, and most species that ever lived are now extinct, uh, <coughs> probably more than 99.9% .9 of them. Um, the human species itself is believed at one point to have come very close to extinction. Uh, some 75,000 years ago, genetic evidence suggests that there was a population bottleneck where there might have been as few as just a couple of thousand surviving individuals at that point. Uh, roughly at the same time, there was a big supervolcanic eruption. So it's possible that that was the cause of this. 
um, had that whatever caused that bottleneck been just slightly more severe, then that would have been the end of it. Uh, you can't go very much lower than 500 reproducing females and still have a viable population. We know that other intelligent species have gone extinct. Uh, the Neanderthals, uh, which were with us until just a, a few tens of thousands of years ago, are gone. Um, there is some uncertain evidence uh, uh, that there might have been another intelligent little species, like the Hobbit man. Uh, the skeletal finds are still unclear there, but they might have been around until as recently as 12,000 years ago, but they are extinct. Um, there are a couple of um, theoretical arguments, which are very interesting, but I won't go into them now. Uh, if people want to talk about them later in discussion, we can do so. Um, we can look at the opinions of various people who have thought about uh, extinction risk or existential risk. Um, we held a uh, conference here um, two years ago. I think it was actually in this room. Uh, and we did, at the end of the, the conference, this was different experts on different catastrophic risks from different areas, uh, physicists, <laughs> geologists, social scientists, um, a poll at the end of it. Um, and one of the questions was, what do you think is the overall risk of human extinction prior to uh, 2100? And the median answer there was 19%. Uh, 19%, which is... Uh, is, is, is quite disconcertingly high. Uh, now, there might be a, a selection effect here in that the people attending a conference on global catastrophic risk might be more likely to think that there are significant risks of that kind. Uh, nevertheless, they, they were unusually well informed and it's in line with other probability estimates. Um, you have to sort of read exactly what it is that there are estimates of, but uh, it's not an untypical figure. Uh, the Stern report on, on the economic impact of climate change, uh, for instance, uses an implicit uh, extinction risk per 100 years of approximately 10%. That's how they get their discount rate into it. To avoid the potential damage from being infinite, they've got to have a temporal discount rate. Stern argues that there is no fundamental moral reason to count the future less, so then how are you going to get the discount rate? And he assumes that there is a certain risk per unit of time that we cease to exist. Um, so that's also in line with that. Um, and um, finally, of course, we can consider specific existential risks that seem to be on the horizon, and uh, there are a number of them. Uh, if you remember the definition, uh, human extinction would be one kind of existential risk. That's certainly one way in which intelligent life can permanently and drastically or the, the, the prospects of intelligent life can be permanent and drastically curtailed. Uh, there are some other categories of existential risks as well. Um, unrecovered collapse, permanent stagnation, flawed realization, ephemeral realization. We, we don't need to go into the details here, but just a, a quick um, survey of some of the, the possibilities um, reinforce this, this point, I think, that uh, we have no good reason to be uh, very confident that the level of existential risk is small. Um, one point that emerges either by looking carefully at the different specific risks or by just thinking about it more generally is that of the two different kinds of risks, risks that arise from nature independently of human activity and risks that arise somehow out of human activity, is all the biggest existential risks, at least as far as the next century or two are concerned, are all anthropogenic. And one way of uh, seeing the possibility of this is to consider that the human species has been around for more than 100,000 years and we have survived volcanic eruptions, uh, we have survived earthquakes, we have survived all kinds of dangerous animals uh, and meteor impacts and solar flares and all of that. So it seems unlikely that any of those things would do us in within the next 100 years if we've already you know, survived 100,000 years of that. Uh, by contrast, uh, we are now introducing entirely new factors into the world which we have no track record of surviving. Um, we, we haven't lived in a world with you know, artificial intelligence or with advanced nanotechnological weapons. 
or with sophisticated forms of biowarfare. We have no long track record of surviving those. Um, let me make a little uh, digression before moving on with our basic scenario categories. Um, it's interesting to consider the question of just how bad it would be if uh, humanity went extinct. Uh, Derek Parfit is a very uh, one of the world's leading philosophers, just actually here at Oxford, uh, uh, in a book once uh, considered a book on moral philosophy, not 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 on, on existential risks. But in passing, he considered this this little um, thought experiment here. Suppose you have three possibilities. One is that disaster is avoided. One is that the disaster occurs and it kills 99% of all humans. But 1% survive and eventually the population can grow again. Uh, and the third possibility is that the disaster occurs and it kills all humans and then there is no more intelligent life. So it's clear that A is better than B and B <laughs> is better than C. Um, but the interesting question is uh, how big are the differences? Is the difference between A and B about, uh, is, is the difference between A and B in terms of badness larger or smaller than the difference between B and C? So the number of people killed, the difference there in terms of the number of people killed is larger between A and B than between B and C. Right, so the difference is between A and B, well, A, zero people are killed. If B occurs, then 99% of the world population, that's 6.7 billion or so, are killed. So the difference is 6.7 billion. The difference between B and C is just no, 67 million uh, or, uh, or thereabouts. Um, so in terms of the number of people killed, the difference between A and B is... Uh, you know, 99 times greater than the difference between B and C. But there is another view, which is that if you consider the value of future generations coming into existence, then the difference between B and C can be vastly greater than the difference between A and B, because there are so many more people that could live in the future than are alive at the current time. So obviously we're not going to settle uh, here this deep question in population ethics, but let's run for the a moment with the assumption that we think that it doesn't, uh, people don't count less just because uh, they exist at a later point in time. Uh, and let's suppose that we count everybody the same and value the bringing into existence of happy lives. Um, then there are some interesting implications. So if we consider decision theory in the standard simplest uh, box standard way, what you're supposed to do is to choose an action that maximizes expected utility. Where the expected utility is simply you know, the probability of an outcome times the value of that outcome. And then you sum up over all the different possible outcomes. Now, if we apply that to actions that have some effect on existential risks, we get interesting results. So consider first the opportunity cost of a delay in technological development. Um, we will make some perhaps conservative assumption that people have to be biological. We can't have computer people or artificial intelligence is counting as people. Um, suppose that uh, 10 billion people with mature technology, like the limits of technology that we might one day achieve, maybe a million years from now, whatever, uh, that may, perhaps 10 billion people uh, could be sustained around an average star using nanotechnology to re-engineer the planets and all of that. The uh, supercluster could then contain the Virgo supercluster, 10 to the power of 23 biological humans. That's one followed by 23 zeros. Um, this corresponds to a loss of potential equal to about 10 to the power of 14 potential human lives per second of delayed colonization. So it doesn't matter whether it takes you know, 500 years or uh, 500 million years before we would actually have developed this kind of mature technology. But however long it takes, if it had happened one second earlier, it means that 
10 to the power of 14 additional entire human lives could have been lived. So with this line of reasoning, it seems that there is a very strong imperative to accelerate development as much as possible. Uh, time really is worth a great deal if we think about what that time eventually might result in when we have sort of super galactic civilizations. Um, but the true lesson of this kind of consideration is, is slightly different. Uh, reflect that the lifespan of galaxies is measured in billions of years, whereas if we're considering some delay in technological development, we might consider causing a delay of, of a year or some decades or so. Um, and the upshot of this is that consideration of existential risk trumps consideration of opportunity cost. Um, to reduce by even just one percentage point net existential risk would be worth a delay of over 10 million years. It's much more important to ensure that we eventually get to realize this immense potential than to make sure that it happens one second uh, sooner. Um, but consider how strong the apparent reason was for accelerating technological development. There are all these lives that would be lost by a delay of even one second. Now I was just arguing that there was something even more important than that, which is to reduce existential risk. So under this assumption that we count additional happy lives coming into existence uh, as much as we do current lives, we then get quite robustly a kind of rule of thumb, which one can call the maxi puck rule, maximize the probability of an okay outcome, where an okay outcome is any outcome that avoids existential disaster. Um, so it seems that if you have this kind of um, value that is sort of time neutral and that places equal value on bringing happy people into existence, then any good you might think you could do by um, you know, alleviate, abolishing world hunger or eliminating malaria or any other thing like that that would be immensely good would be completely trumped by even the slightest reduction in the total amount of existential risk. If you could bring down the probability of existential risk by, you know, one millionth of one percent in expected utility terms, that would be worth a lot more. Um, which is the reason why I'm interested in, in this topic. Uh, one might think that if so much is at stake, uh, and by anybody's standards, there's a lot at stake, even if you don't count future generations, I mean, there's still a lot at stake, that there would be an enormous amount of research uh, focused on this issue of, of ensuring humanity's survival. <coughs> it is not so. Um, we did a little literature survey, this is uh, from a year or two ago, comparing the amount of research on human extinction uh, with the amount of research on the dung beetle. And we found that the dung beetle win uh, wins out quite handily. Uh, even if we restrict it to uh, studies on dung beetle reproduction, there's still a lot more scholarly interest in that uh, than in existential risk. Now, these statistics are a little bit, a little bit iffy. So there, there certainly are some specific types of existential risks where there is a significant amount of research. Um, uh, nuclear war, there is literature on that, um, global warming, Although not mainly because it's an existential risk, the, the thing that really motivates all that research is the smaller risks from, 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 from those categories. Um, but the point stands, uh, there, there is a lack of a sense of proportion. Um, and it seems that the less important something is, the more people are working on it. Um, Okay, so we've considered the extinction uh, category, and that, that certainly seems to be one, one, one sort of fairly plausible way that things could go. Um, it remains to, to consider scenarios in which we break through this human uh, condition in the other direction, into what we might call loosely a post-human condition. I, we sh shouldn't, the, the, the term post-human might not be the best one, but we have to call it something. So, just completely arbitrarily, let, 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 let's 
illustrate a few things that we might count as a post-human condition. Suppose there were more than a trillion people, and maybe that, you can call that, if, if life expectancy were greater than 500 years, or if most of the population had cognitive capacities, at least a couple of standard deviations above the current human maximum, uh, if we had near complete control over sensory inputs for the majority of people most of the time, living in a completely virtual world almost all the time, if human psychological suffering became a very rare occurrence, that, or any other change uh, that is of the comparable uh, magnitude or profundity to any of the above. So it's like really, really big change. We're, we're not talking about uh, you know, a slightly different political system becoming popular or a new culture sweeping the globe, but some kind of very big and fundamental change. <clears throat> um, so that kind of, one can, one can think of a couple of different ways. You could either imagine this uh, being achieved slowly uh, and gradually in a very long time. That's kind of the lower curve there. We continue to slug away with this, our science and technology and you know, 30,000 years from now, maybe we will have, you know, eventually colonized some other planets and maybe there are a trillion people and some of these things happen. But the other scenario here uh, is one where this kind of transition happens uh, soon and suddenly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. One might think that any very dramatic change like this, that it would be very, that it would be a stretch of imagination to think that this, that this could happen very quickly. But, but consider um, that if the Earth formed one year ago, then our species has only been around for 12 minutes, whole year since the Earth formed. This is very, very short time in, in a kind of geological time scale. Agriculture would have started just one minute ago. The Industrial Revolution would have taken place two seconds ago. The electronic computer was invented four tenths of a second ago. And the internet just a tenth of a second ago, literally in the blink of an eye. Um, now it's hard to, to look at this and not get this sense that there is some kind of very dramatic change occurring right now or almost about to occur. And people have been picking up on this, I think, Initially, the first reference to this, this kind of idea that we seem to be moving towards some kind of singularity or discontinuity was um, reported by Stanislav Ulam, the great physicist, in a conversation with uh, John von Neumann back in 1956. Um, he said that our conversation centered on the ever accelerating uh, progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life, which gives appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race, beyond which human affairs, as we know them, could not continue. Um, so one might wonder what kind of thing could possibly cause or bring about such a singularity. And I, I should warn that the word singularity in recent years has been used in many different senses, and uh, some, some of them uh, not very plausible or interesting. Um, so it's probably time to move to a different word if one wants to be precise in one's discussion. But um, if one wants to think about what kind of thing could possibly give rise to something like that, it might be worth reflecting on what gave rise to the human condition in the first place, from the pre-human condition. And obviously there were many factors, but certainly central to the whole equation was uh, some small little changes uh, in whatever genes are responsible for neurological development. These are kind of the, the brightest specimens of, of, of these two species. Uh, they're both impressive in different ways. But one is developing string theory, and, and the other is, is learning to, uh, to ask for bananas by lifting a token. Uh, so you could wonder if, if just a few, I mean, basically, what's inside the box here is not that different. If you look at it, one is slightly larger than the other and has slightly more folds. And there might be some subtle changes that you don't see without the microscope that we don't know yet. But there are, there are a few regulatory genes that have changed, and, and this gives rise to all the rest of it, all our language, our culture, our technology, our complex social organizations, all the good and the bad in human history ultimately flowed from our ability to learn and to communicate and to 
to build up ideas and figure things out. So a very little difference uh, could have these world-wide uh, ramifications. Now, you could then ask yourself if there were some further little tweaks like that. Uh, might that not also possibly have comparably world-changing ramifications? Um, so the, the eminent statistician uh, I.G. Good wrote in 1965, and this gives a kind of more focused version of the singularity hypothesis. Um, he noted, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. That would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. Um, and you can, you can see how this could be a very explosive development. Now, once you get a machine that's better at making uh, an artificial intelligence than we are, then the next development cycle will be conducted by this superior developer of AI which might then develop a better AI, which will then apply its greater intelligence and its faster mind to making a faster improvement of itself. And you could imagine getting a kind of a runaway uh, effect and very rapidly go perhaps from something somewhat above human level to something radically superhumanly intelligent. Um, the hardware is ticking along uh, quite nicely. The, the big problem is the software. <clears throat> uh, and there are different approaches you could imagine to this, from the classical logistic AI uh, paradigms to ones on the other end of the spectrum that are based more on drawing in inspiration from uh, how the human brain is organized. In, in the limiting case, uh, just basically copying the uh, computational architecture that, and the learning algorithms that the human brain uses and then just running it on a, on a faster computer. Um, so um, so that, that I think of, of the different things that are discussed in the context of this singularity stuff, I think that the real interesting core is this idea of a, an intelligence explosion. Um, uh, one can think of a kind of space of possible modes of beings, it, it just thinking about what might the post-human condition cons be like, not so much from the outside, but what might it be like to be a, a, a citizen in a post-human world. Um, we can think of a space of possible modes of being, a, where a mode of being would be a way of thinking, feeling, relating, acting. And the, the space of human possible modes of being is a tiny little crumb in, in this large space that there are just a lot more modes of beings that are inaccessible to us humans with our current biological capacities than are possible. I mean, we are a small subset of the uh, set of modes of beings that are accessible to animals. Uh, so a dolphin might, you know, have sonar and uh, birds can fly with their own locomotion and <laughs> Presumably, there are animals that have very different mentalities and feelings than, than we can have. Um, we can then imagine a, a range of other possible modes of beings. If, if we could live for tens of thousands of years, or if we uh, had much greater control over our own you know, mental states and so forth. And presumably, there are vastly many more modes of beings that we can't even imagine just as uh, Kanzi in the earlier picture, the chimpanzee, couldn't imagine what it would be like to be human. You know, just don't have the, 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 the faculty necessary for conceptualizing human activities and human concerns and human experiences. So there might be other types of experiences that we can't even imagine because they just don't fit into a three pound lump of, of cheesy matter that, that we used to think with. Um, <coughs> So it's quite humbling to think about how, 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 how parochial our situation is. I mean, we live in a very unusual time. I mean, all, all these earlier graphs and stuff, it's, it's really like a, a great anomaly out of all the time that has been, whether on 
cosmic, geological, or historical timescales. Um, spatially, of course, we are a huge anomaly as well. I mean, almost all of space is empty. It's a very, very cold place out there, uh, and it's just a lot of empty space. Uh, and even of the crumbs that exist there, uh, practically all of them are completely inhospitable to any kind of biological life. Um, and, and perhaps mentally as well, and intellectually, and in cultural terms, we might be confined to this tiny little dot among all the different possible mentalities that could exist. Um, so this is, this is our group, uh, different Future of Humanity Institute, which I run, uh, multidisciplinary research institute. Um, we try to apply careful thinking to some of the that some of the specific questions that arise within these overall themes that I have discussed. Um, here are some recent work which I will not discuss, but if we're on short on questions, I might discuss some of this. Um, yeah, so let's open it up for, for discussion. Thank you.